Okay, so today what I've decided to do is do a video about my previous favorite metal group, Sabotage. Um, they have been replaced by Symphony X as my favorite, but um, Sabotage is absolutely amazing. Um, I was introduced to Sabotage back in 1980, I want to say 86, um, by my cousin. And my cousin was a big uh, metalhead. He, he loved heavy metal music. And so I want to start this off by talking about metal music. Metal music does get a, a bum rap. Um, you know, I, I like all kinds of music. My all? taste. Yes, all. Okay. You, there is this myth that I don't like country. I do like one country song. <laughs> And it's called Good Enough For Now by Weird Al Yankovic. And you should go give that a listen. Um, but metal music, um, to me, you know, I grew up with, you know, the, the feeling from, like, my mom and from, you know, the rest of the family, you know, it's just like, oh, metal music, that stuff's so horrible. All they do is they, you know, cut the strings of a guitar and make it sound like it's shredding and shorting out and it's horrible, horrible stuff. Um, and then when my brother uh, got home from his mission, um, he was actually turned on to some pretty good music. While he was there, he shouldn't have been listening to it. That was bad of him. Um, but um, he brought home uh, two key musical <coughs> um, figures that, that kind of changed my perception of music. Uh, Billy Idol and Ozzy Osbourne. Um, and as I listened to it, I went into it with the prejudice of you can't like metal music, that stuff's horrible. And I started listening to it, and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And the thing is, you now my tastes are very diverse. You know, I like everything from classical piano um, all the way up to metal. Um, and yet, one thing you'll find is that classical and metal actually have the most in common of any of the two music genres. And you can argue that one if you want. Go ahead, you'll lose, but that's okay. Um, so, so this young man with me again, Tucker, he's awesome, say hi to the people. Hi to the people. Um, I have introduced him to quite a few groups, and he's actually pretty well, um, what's the word for it? Educated. Well, educated in music, but you're you're very diverse. Yeah, you like a lot of types of music, and, and and I like that because I do not like people just sticking to one, um, one type of music and just sticking with that, and that's it. Um, I would confuse a lot of people driving up to my house. Uh, one day I would drive up and I would be blaring Sarah Brightman. The next day I'd be blaring Metallica. The next day Megadeth. The next day. You know, it just, it would change, and people would look at me weird, like, hmm. So yeah, I, I would con I would confuse a lot of people. Um, they, they just didn't understand how I could like such a vast array of music. I mean, from soft and, you know, classical to all the way up to some thrash. I don't like thrash metal, um, but there was some that, almost qualifies as thrash. Um, that, that's something for another time. But what I decided to do today is talk about Sabotage. Um, amazing group uh, founded by John Oliva and his brother Chris. Um, and I won't go into the whole history of the band and stuff. You can look that up. They, they, it's an interesting, interesting uh, uh, story about their band. Um, so we'll talk about a couple things, but not much. What I wanted to do is go over their, their, their albums, there's 12 of them, and just rank them from the worst to the best, which there is no worst with these guys. Um, they're that good. Um, I have subjected Tucker to some of their music so he could just get a taste for them, so he could give us, you know, um, another perspective, another view. Um, but I wanted to talk about their albums. Um, in my opinion, their worst album, which, okay, their least best album, they did not have a bad album. 
So just remember that right here. There is no bad Sabotage album. Um, but their, their least greatest is Power of the Night. Um, which is funny because I have, I have a picture of Power of the Night up on my wall. The album cover? The album cover. It's on my wall. Um, which is to say that it is good. It's good enough for me to, to have them on my wall. Um, they're, they're an amazing group. Um, and the song that I picked out of it um, was In the Dream. Now, I'm not going to play the songs for you. I'll just show you the album art. See? Show you the album art. Um, and then you can go onto YouTube. I've looked up every song that I'm going to talk about. And it is available on YouTube. So if you just type in the, the Sabotage and then the name of the song, you'll bring up um, a video for it. So you can listen to the song and see why I'm saying this. Um, so I had you listen to In the Dream, right? Mm -hmm. And what did you think? It was interesting. Uh, we'll probably mention it later down the road, but their stuff is very diverse. Like Even within one song, there's a lot of... Like, there is a lot going on, but not in a bad way. They just have a lot of talents and abilities that they incorporate into every song, and so each one's different. And a lot of their stuff, they'll start out calm, or even start out hard, and then get calm, and then it ramps back up. And yeah. it just does this wave. Um, but Power of the Night was my least favorite album. It's, it's still a good album but it's my least favorite. Um, the next one is Fight for the Rock. Um, the Sabotage group, uh, John and the rest of the band stuff, they hated this album um, because the, from what I've been able to get out of all the interviews and stuff that I've seen, the companies came to them and just said, basically, we need you to be more popish, not you know, just rock, not metal. And so we need you to tone it down. And so they really put handcuffs on the group. And while it's still a great album, um, they it, weren't into it. it. They weren't into it. It was their least favorite. They they were very upset with it actually. Um, and off of that, um, one thing I love is is that uh, Sabotage uses um, a lot of story driven, um, mythological driven. Um, subjects for their songs mm -hmm. and so on that album there was a song called Hyde and talking about Jekyll and Hyde and so when I was in school um, it was we, Jekyll and Hyde was one of the books we were doing and what I would do in this class is every every paper that I would write about a book I would also include a CD with a metal song pertaining to the book we read so one thing I love about metal is they do a lot of literature based uh, songs, um, and Hyde is a, a great song. Um, my teacher loved it. It was a very... It, it represented Jekyll and Hyde very well because, I don't know, just the I don't know, dichotomy of the good and evil, the sane and the insane. It, it was weird seeing him, hearing it play out because like the book you're reading and like seeing it play out the movies or whatever that's somebody else portraying it but the music it was telling it itself not just the lyrics it was it was, it was weird it was cool yeah it's it's an incredible song and you know it's off of the band's least favorite album my second least favorite um but it's still good mm -hmm. Great song. And, and all of these songs that I'm going to mention, like I said, you can go onto YouTube and look them up, um, and you're good. Um, my next album is Handful of Rain. Um, this one, it was good. It's a good album. In fact, a lot of people put it a lot higher. Um, it was the album after um, John's brother was killed in an automobile accident. And he was actually on his way to a benefit concert and was hit by a drunk driver and he was killed. Um, and so for that, for that album, um, John Oliva, John Oliva, sorry, Oliva, Oliva. Um, he was not the lead singer. 
and I'll get to that, you know, on the one that they came out with, that he wasn't the lead singer, and I actually found out the whole story of it just the other day, and so it's pretty cool. But, um, Handful of Rain, uh, the song is called Stare Into the Sun, and so if you want to look that one up, it's a great song, it's a good album. Okay, the next one is called, and if you have any comments, just yes. stop me, okay? Next one is Gutter Ballet. Um, this was the first album that he really put, they really put um, piano into their music. Um, this was their fourth album, I believe. And it was a time when Paul O'Neill had taken over. He had just done Hollow Mountain King, which we'll get to later. But Paul O'Neill said, Hey man, why don't you use piano more in your music? You can play all these instruments. John Oliva is a mastermind. Um, he is amazing. The, there are two people in the entire music industry that I would actually want to meet. Um, he is one of them, and Sarah Brightman is the other. So that tells you the diversity that I have in the music. It's, um, I want to meet John Oliva and then Sarah Brightman. I uh, absolutely love Sarah Brightman. And I'll, we'll do a thing on her next, probably. Um, <coughs> Gutter Ballet, fantastic album. Um, like I said, it does incorporate a lot of piano into the music. Mm -hmm. And uh, absolutely fantastic album. Uh, the story of the, of the, what was the song? Gutter, or from the gutter to the, it was a song like that. No, you're thinking of um, John Oliva's Pain, the one that I oh, showed that's, you. Oh, that's a different one. And, and Sorry, then. So, John Oliva made, um, he has multiple um, projects, one of which is John Oliva's Pain, and he uh, he did a song of all the titles of his music. Okay, that's what that one is. And it was a full song of just titles of his music, and it's, it's really good. Um, Okay. Then comes Edge of Thorns. So so far we have from worst worst to best. So far we have Power of the Night, Fight for the Rock, Handful of Rain, Gutter Ballet, and now Edge of Thorns. Edge of Thorns was the first album where um, John Oliva was not the lead singer. In fact, he didn't sing in that album. And you found out the hard and way. I, yeah, I found out. Just I, I watched this uh, awesome video with him. Um, and he told a lot of stories that at the end of the Streets tour, um, he was coughing up blood. He was he was just having a really hard time with his throat, and I guess he had some medical issues with his throat and stuff. He had to take a year and a half off. He could not sing, not even Happy Birthday, he said. He could not sing for a year and a half. And so they had a new album coming out, and so they got uh, Zach Stevens. Uh, to replace him, and which he did a fantastic job. Uh, Zach Stevens is actually really good. He went on to make a group called Circle to Circle, and they're actually pretty good. Um, and that was Edge of Thorns. And the song I have for that is He Carves His Stone. I, I do like that song. I mean, I like almost all their songs. There are very few sabotage songs I don't like, but there are a couple. I'm not going to get into that. Um, so this next one, I was, uh, how old was I? I want to say 15 or 16. We went to Oregon. We visited my cousin's house, and he said, guys, you got to listen to this new group. They're amazing. And he gave us um, a tape of The Dungeons Are Calling. And at this time, you know, we were, we were into D&D, &D and we were just, you know, we liked the mythological stuff, and The Dungeons Are Calling, amazing album, amazing album, amazing song, this, this new group, um, the singer was just amazing, um, and so for that, for that album, if you look up the song The Dungeons Are Calling, uh, the, so the, the title track, um, absolutely amazing track. Mm -hmm. um, I love these guys. Um, so what did you think of Dungeons and Calling? That was very much a like Pathfinder D and D <laughs> narrative. I mean, even just like Lord of the Rings. Like it's 
it's cool. Like, I don't know. It, it was just Very cool stuff. putting you in that mindset of being in an underground dungeon or something, and you're trying to get out, and you can't, and then the, the ending is messed up. It's so cool. Okay, the next one um, is Sirens. Sirens was actually their first album, I believe. Um, and Sirens is the song that you want to listen to off that. Again, I put um, Dungeons Are Calling and Sirens right on the same page. Um, it's hard to put either one above the other. They're both fantastic. And again, they sing about mythological creatures, Sirens. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's an awesome, awesome album. Um, and these were their first ones. Yeah, well and then parts of it he makes kind of like the siren song part mm -hmm. of the song and I thought that was really cool because yeah the the whole thing with sirens is once they start singing you can't get away and the song really does that like you don't want to stop listening it's like what is this it's good stuff yeah okay um my next favorite is poets and madmen now this was their last album the, the thing about this album was uh, John Oliva had, had uh, stepped down from being the lead singer and so uh, Zach Stevens was the, the lead singer for a few albums. The day before, this is what I've heard and read on the internet, you, know, you can believe everything you see on the internet, um, but um, I've also read interviews uh, with John. Um, the, the day before they were going to go into recording, Zach Stevens called him and said, I can't do it. I got this new band. Uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to do this, but we also need your help with the new band. <laughs> and so, which he did help him, and, you know, they're, they're still good friends. Um, but it put John back into the lead singer role, which, you which I happy. loved, loved, absolutely loved, because he's got an amazing voice. They call him uh, the Mountain King, and we'll get to that in a minute, but uh, he, he's amazing. Um, the song off of that one that I picked is called Morphine Child, um, so go look that one up. I mean, go look up all these songs. I, I went and checked, double checked. They're all on YouTube. I'm not going to put any songs on here because I have read enough horror stories about people getting sued by the music industry <laughs> um, but for putting songs on. So any of the music that you hear on my site is taken from a site that does royalty-free music and you just buy the song and you can use it. And so like my Chatting with Awesome People song, that is a purchased song. So I own the rights to use it. I don't own the rights to the song, but I own the rights to use it uh, without getting sued. Yeah. And so I don't want to get sued, but you can go look these up. They have them on YouTube, every one of these songs that I'm talking about. Okay, so Poets of Mad Men, fantastic. It was Sabotage's last album. And we'll get to why in just a minute. Um, the next one is Dead One or Dead. Um, fantastic album about the uh, Bosnia-Sarajevo conflict. Um, fantastic, fantastic album. One of my all-time favorite albums ever. Um, and the song that I picked off of this one is Christmas Eve, Sarajevo. Which... Everyone that knows John should have heard this by now. If you haven't, shame on you. Yeah, which everyone has probably actually heard, and they love it. And it, it was funny, because one time during my, my billiards class, um, I played that song, and I said, okay, extra credit for who can tell me who this is by. Everybody raised their hand. I think, I seriously think only two or three people didn't raise their hand. Um, and they all shouted out, Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And I said, nope you're wrong. And they said, no, we're not. But yes, you are. It's done by a group called Sabotage off of their Dead Winter Dead album. And if you, this is the funny part, because you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, I love Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Well, guess what, people? <laughs> Trans-Siberian Orchestra is Sabotage. It is John Oliva, um, Paul O'Neill, um, and Zach Stevens and all them actually performed every now and then with them. It is sabotage. So if you like trans and Orchestra, you're listening to a metal group. A very hardcore metal group. <laughs> so, it's very funny. Um, 
<laughs> but yeah. Anything you want to say up to this point? Nope. Uh, he filled me in more on the story behind the whole album, and it really cool. Just, I yeah. mean, you, you can have a song tell a story, and, you know, that'd be like the only song in the album, the others are their own thing. They do whole albums that tell a story. Like, yeah, it's crazy. And so that one especially, I mean, just hearing how they wove it together, just crazy. Yeah, Dead Runner Dead is a fantastic album. Um, you should definitely listen to that one. Um, it's, it's, you know, my fourth highest ranked album, so that's good. Uh, my next one is Wake of Magellan. And uh, the song off of that is The Hourglass. Again, um, fantastic album. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the Wake of Magellan, I believe this one is about... Yesterday said Irish Mafia. The, the Irish Mafia. And so, or something like that. It's to that effect. And it talks about a reporter that went and tried to expose them and, you know, disappeared, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, Wake of Magellan, the song is The Hourglass. Go listen to it. It's amazing. Okay, now, this was a hard one. <laughs> because I had to choose between two albums that I absolutely love. Okay? So, unfortunately, I had to pick one for my tops and one for my second place. But it's not putting either one down. Um, second place is Hall of the Mountain King. So what they did was Sabotage had just about folded. They were going to be done. Paul O'Neill stepped in and said, uh, no, you're not going to be done. You guys may not go off and uh, John Oliva was going to... I don't think you've explained who Paul O'Neill is yet. I'm sorry, Paul O'Neill is the guy that stepped in after um, Fight for the Rock um, because the band was going to split. Uh, John was going to go audition for uh, Black Sabbath, and Chris was, I forgot where he was going to go, but another big name group. And Paul O'Neill stepped in and just said, no guys, no. You guys are too good, you got too much talent, you're sticking together. And so he was their financial backer, he was their creative mind, um, wrote a lot of their lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, just amazing guy. Um, stepped in and, and saved the band. Um, and so, How the Mountain King was that album that Paul O'Neill first stepped into. And they did a rendition of How the Mountain King. Uh, they call it Prelude to Madness. So if you're going to go look this up, look up Prelude to Madness slash Howl of the Mountain King. Um, so it's the classical piece followed by a musical piece with lyrics. Um, and Chris Oliva just showed he was a master in the guitar. Mm -hmm. um, it is absolutely fantastic. Um, your thoughts on that? Well, just Prelude to Madness. I mean, I always liked the Hall of the Mountain King. It was just such a fun song, doing it in band and things. And, you know, we did it for hours and hours, starting out slow. And then over time, we'd speed it up. And then it just got ridiculous. And we had so much fun with it. And so hearing a very different version, but still the same song. It was so fun to listen to, especially with just how they did it. They got it going crazy fast. They had all these insane instruments that you would never think to use, but they made it work and it was amazing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, that is, and that whole album is a fantastic album. Mm -hmm. um, but then we're gonna get to the number one album. Um, like I said, I had a hard time deciding whether it was Hall of Mountain King or this one. Um, it is Straits. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm clairvoyant. I don't know. That the album is called Straits, a rock opera. Um, <laughs> so it's it's a rock opera. It, it tells a, a story of a guy that, you know, was a drug dealer, turned into a star, back to drug dealing and all this stuff. It, it's, it's, the story is not so great, but I mean, it's okay. The music is fantastic. And they go through such um, highs and lows as far as the types of music. They go piano, they go soft, they go hard, they go you know, near thrash levels. Um, that one has melodic. like I mean, classical instruments in it, right? Oh yeah, String lots of classical everything. instruments, lots yeah. of piano. That one um, was all over the map. Um, but they, they work it out to perfection. Yeah. Um, it is just absolutely amazing. 
and this album. The only reason I gave this album the nod was because it has my all-time favorite Sabotage song, If I Go Away. Um, again, look that up on, on YouTube. You can listen to that. Um, just an amazing, amazing group. Um, they do have some very interesting stories. Um, like when they were stuck in Germany, um, after their Fight for the Rock tour, they were in Germany, and the band manager actually stole all their money. Um, and so they had almost no money at all. And they were very upset, very mad. The people in Germany were overly nice to them. And so I read an article where John says that he uh, got them back by peeing on the Berlin Wall. And so... <laughs> Which I found was hilarious, because that's not just something you did and no, lived. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> but one thing I love is you can see the maturity as the, the group grows into... I mean, you, you tell when people start out. Okay, they're young, they're full of energy, they have these ideas, they just want to rock, rock and roll, you know, they want to scream and they want to, they want to make headbanging music, okay? And something happens with age, you gain wisdom, you gain experience, you gain insights, you wisen up. And you're tired. And you're tired. Um, and so their music became more meaningful, their music became um, deeper, uh, more fleshed out. Um, John is a mastermind. He is absolutely an amazing musician. Um, one of my all-time favorites. Like I said, if there's anybody in the music industry I'd want to meet, it's him and Sarah Brightman. But not at the same time. I think he would offend her. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, give this group a listen. You know, check out some of these songs. And, yeah. So that's all. We're, we're just bored, so we're doing this again. Yep. So any last words? Rock on. Party on, dudes. <laughs>